I'm Erica Zavaleta and this is Ecosystems of California. Today we're at Younger Lagoon Reserve on the UCSC Marine Campus to look at California's beach ecosystems. Later today we'll go look at another beach, Scotts Creek, north of Santa Cruz as well. This is a pocket beach bounded on either side by rocky headlands. And in other places where you have river deltas or creek mouths, you can have the long beaches form like Scotts Creek up north of Santa Cruz or Main Beach at the mouth of the San Lorenzo River or like the beaches around the mouth of the San Diego River in Southern California. This is also what's called a reflective beach. The waves are breaking in really close to shore. It's a steep beach and there's a lot of energy in the swash zone, which is the zone where the water is actively washing up over the sand. And that's in contrast with a dissipative beach that's shallow for a long way out, it's sloping much more gradually, and the waves are breaking over a much larger distance from shore. So where does all the sand come from that's on a beach like this? As you can imagine, it's a really dynamic process. Most of the sand, 80 or 95 percent, is coming from the uplands. It's washed down rivers and streams by erosion, and it includes everything from sediment that's finer than sand to big rocks and cobbles. And then, when that sand is washed out, the currents and the prevailing winds and waves, particularly the wave action from the northwest, set up a kind of a river of sand that runs all the way down the California coast, moving sand from northwest to southeast. Along the way, that sand gets deposited on these beaches and removed seasonally. And a pocket beach backed by bluffs can have an enormous amount of sand moving on or off it every year. This is a low sand year because a lot of sand has stayed offshore in offshore sandbars rather than getting redeposited on the beach. So tens or thousands or hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of sand can move past a single point on the coast every year. The ultimate fate of all that sand can be the dunes at the back of this beach, but a lot of it is going to end up in places like the submarine canyon that bisects Monterey Bay. So these beaches need a steady resupply of sand. And because people have in all kinds of ways stabilized or cut off the flow of sediments and sand and erosion from the uplands, most of the beaches in California now are considered eroding. The high tide strand line or the drift line on this beach isn't very clear, but on some beaches marks where the 24 hour high tide line is and that's the main place where all of this rack, this macrophyte debris from greens and reds and brown algae and carcasses of marine mammals, driftwood, all of that is getting deposited. So at the landward most edge of the beach there are plants like that beach burr but the beach itself is not a plant dominated system and what we get here in terms of plants and other inputs comes from the ocean. The beach itself is dominated by animals. What kinds of animals? Highly mobile animals that can deal with the constantly shifting tides, the blowing sand, the desiccation and day-night cycles. So you have kelp flies, for example, on this feather boa kelp, and they're diurnal. Most of the animals on a beach that are going to come out at night are nocturnal. They come out in the dark to feed on rack, about 40% of the invertebrates in beach invertebrate communities are feeding on the rack. And the rest are feeding on detritus that penetrates down into the sand, in the water, or on other kinds of carrion, dead marine mammals, and that kind of thing that are going to wash up. And of course, lots of other non-resident animals use the beach. Here and in this area, you have seals and sea lions coming out to rest and to give birth and breed. You have seabirds and shorebirds coming to feed on things like the sand crabs. And then just slightly offshore, you have sea otters, particularly young ones, who are feeding in really close to the beach on things like subtidal clams and crabs. Just like the nocturnal animals that are resident on the beach, a lot of nocturnal visitors will come through here. Bobcats, raccoons, coyotes, and all kinds of other nocturnal visitors will come down to feed on the rack line at night. These are sand crabs, a type of hippid crab that burrow into the sand at the beach. And what they do is they follow the active swash zone up and down the beach. So 
with every tidal cycle, they're moving underneath the sand, up the beach and down the beach. Another interesting thing about sand crabs is that they bioaccumulate everything from pesticides and toxins like DDT to heavy metals really effectively. So they've been used as bioindicators in a variety of ways, and they were a key factor in understanding the coastal distribution of DDT in Southern California following a long-term incident of DDT pollution involving the Montrose Chemical Company from the 1950s to the 1970s. Now I'm gonna let one of these guys go and you can see what incredibly mobile and effective diggers they are. Okay, I'm gonna let one go and watch how quickly they can dig in. There they go. Now let's head up to Scotts Creek to have a look at that beach. Wow, here's a sea otter carcass. So stuff that washes up on the beach and feeds these beach systems includes all that kelp and rack, and it includes animals too. So this guy looks like maybe he got eaten some before he washed up. Could have been by a shark or maybe an orca. And um, then up here on the beach, seabirds are gonna peck at this, maybe raccoons at night, maybe a turkey vulture during the day. Um, this is a pretty good chunk of food here. And this otter, you don't normally get the chance to see this, it's got these really sharp teeth. So we'll talk more about otters later, but it's eating this huge variety of things itself. So it's eating crabs that are subtitle on the beach, abalone, urchins, a whole variety of other animals that are less mobile than it is. So we'll leave that there for something else to work on. Coastal strand and beach ecosystems are heavily subsidized by production offshore in the ocean or up on land. So I'm standing on about a meter deep pile of rotting kelp and seagrass that is covered with kelp flies. It doesn't smell very good. And it's this production that's gonna support the food web here on this piece of coast. There's a dead harbor seal washed up on the beach. Looks like maybe a shark took a chunk out of it and that's why it's up here, but that could also be something after the fact on land that came up to feed on it, and you can see all the flies. You can see all the kelp flies on the rack over there. Kelp flies have enormous biomass on sandy beaches when seasonal loads of macrophytes wash up on shore, but since they're herbivorous or plant-eating flies, they don't transmit disease or in other ways bother people at the beach the way that your typical house flies or other carrion feeding flies would like the ones on the harbor seal. So there's a contrast to ask yourself about. The dominant strategy in the intertidal zone, which is really dynamic, is to be sessile, to stay put and hang on tight. And the dominant strategy out here at the beach is to be mobile, to constantly move up and down following the tides. So you might think about why those strategies are so different in these two ecosystems that are right at the boundary of the land and the sea. 